All right, can everyone hear me all right? Praise the Lord, we got a few honks in. We got some lovely people I see here, some new faces. Some good old faces. No, just old faces. We got wonderful faces, and I've missed these faces so much. God bless you. Welcome to Living Water Baptist Church. If you're here in person, it is a blessing to have you. If you're here online, it's a blessing to have you. I'll tell you what, there's a different experience either way. But wherever you are, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And where God is, there is... What follows God, Chelsea? Grace always follows God. Because He is so graceful and He's so faithful. And we are so blessed to be together in His name. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. Please... Join me then in a word of prayer. If everyone please bow their heads. Dear Lord, my God, we thank you for your graciousness in every way, God. We thank you for your love with which you love us. God, it is so great and we are so blessed, God. And I pray that today you would honor us with your presence. Lord, that you'd help us to recognize we're two or more, God, that you are in our midst, God. And that means you are here right now. So, Lord, I pray right now you would sanctify this ground. I pray that right now you would prepare our hearts and our minds for the message you are going to teach us. Lord, just be with us today and lead us in praise and worship that we might honor you. Lord, thank you for bringing us together again. Thank you for allowing our church family every opportunity to worship. It's in your holy and precious name I pray. Amen. Now, I know many of you have come specifically for this. I've asked Chelsea back and... This week she's wearing a coat, so that's even more enthusiasm, and it's a little bit rainy, but I'll tell you what, it's still a beautiful day, so thank you again for coming, thank you all for coming here, here in the back, can I get a hallelujah honk? Um, amen, I, I welcome Chelsea Ford to sing for us today. Last week we had technical difficulties, and I had people calling my telephone as I was trying to sing, so I apologize, and I think we've tried to remedy that as best we can, uh, so I hope that, that doesn't happen today, and if it does, I'll just turn my music off and we'll all sing a cappella together. <laughs>
<laughs> oh, thank you. Wow. Could everyone hear that all right today? I, I could hear it all right. I have my little radio. I was listening on everything. Trying to get the sound perfect for those online and, and those uh, here in, in person this week. I know if you, if, you, if you couldn't hear it very well in your car last week, I want you to know it was still recorded really well online and you could listen to it afterwards. But I think we got it fixed this week so that everyone could enjoy it. And uh, I, I'm excited to, to be together again on this Sunday. And uh, you probably heard the news already. But starting on the 3rd, that is next Sunday, um, the governor has made it possible for us to reopen church uh, and have in-house church services. Now, there's still some restrictions for people with, with uh, shelter at home, uh, shelter at home, high-risk conditions. Uh, but uh, for the rest of us, we're going to be removing one row of chairs so that everyone is a good, adequate distance apart. Uh, we're going to have people wear masks. Uh, just to be extra safe, let's keep my sermon in one place. Um, and uh, we're going to have church in the house of God, praising Him together with one voice, as the Lord has called us to do. And it's going to be, I think, a big blessing. For those of you who can't attend, we're still going to have uh, the online service, so you can still follow along uh, with me. I've been informed that the video screen is backwards. Uh, I do apologize for that. Uh, not a whole lot I could do at this moment. But I'll try to keep us keep us in pace. Uh, I wonder if there's anything I can do about that. Wait, there might be something. Give me just one second. distractions. If you want to turn your Bibles to the book of Romans 7th chapter, today we're going to be actually in Romans 7 and Romans 8. Of course the chapters are, are man-made. If you'd have received this letter, uh, if you were a Roman and you received this letter from Paul in the early first century, uh, well in the latter half of it, you would have received one long scroll without Num without chapter numbers, without verse numbers, it'd just be something to read through from the beginning to the end. So we added the chapter numbers and we added the verse numbers for ourselves so that we could find uh, areas in the scriptures much easier. But at times like that, once in a while the thought goes from one verse to the next, so when we read like that, we can get the whole idea. And so we are going to be constrained by chapter numbers and uh, we're just going to continue on through. So if you have your Bibles with me, we're going to begin reading in Romans 7, starting in verse 18. That'll help with that, I think. And it says this. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is not no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. <clears throat> Romans 8, verse 1 through 4. Therefore, 
There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Amen, brothers and sisters. But what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering, and so He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, <clears throat> you'll probably agree with the first thing I say. I'd hope you would. Sin is bad. I think you'd all agree with that. Matter of fact, sin's not just bad for us and in our lives. It's bad in its totality. Romans 8 tells us that creation itself was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. And then it says this, in hope. You know, when we talk about sin, this is how we teach our kids. And this is how I've at least taught my kids, when I've taught other little kids the same idea. When we do something that is bad, then... What we have done, that is sin. And we kind of get this idea across uh, to little ones that, that that is what sin is. And I think that's a pretty good analysis. It isn't wrong. But I know as adults, we could take it a bit further. We haven't even begun to scratch the surface of what sinfulness is with that little explanation. As a matter of fact, Christ himself expanded upon all the laws as we understood them. He revealed it in ways no one at that time had understood it. Christ said, you've heard, do not murder, but I tell you, do not hate in your heart, because you've murdered then in your heart. Now, does it make you an actual murderer if you've hated someone? No, you haven't literally killed anyone. But Christ wants us to understand how terrible a sin it is in our very being and that we broke the law of God. Christ said, do not commit, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery, but I tell you, do not even lust after someone because you've committed adultery in your heart. Does that mean you've literally been unfaithful to your spouse? Spouse. No, you didn't literally break your vows. You just proved yourself a law breaker and revealed that your heart suffers from the same fatal flaw that all hearts suffer from. And that is sin. And sin has a terrible toll. Sin is not really so simple. It's obviously absolutely everywhere. It stains everything. And most of us are living in the filth of sin day in and day out. And we hardly recognize it. I'm not saying this to be judgmental. I've had to do a lot of soul searching to make sure I could preach this sermon. Hopefully you guys don't think ill of me, but I'm a sinner. I'm, I'm not some special saint in the world. But through Christ, I've been made more than a sinner. And by that I mean less of a sinner. Not that I don't sin. But today I am a benefactor of the grace of God, even though I sin. But that's not the point of my message today. Today I want to talk about the costs of sin and what we can do about it. See, at some point you start to see what sin costs. Sin will always keep you longer than you want to stay. Cost you more than you wanted to pay and take you further than you wanted to go. Where does it take you? James 1.15, I can actually give you the answer. It says, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, gives birth to death. Sin, brothers and sisters, kills. It kills me, it kills you, it kills everybody. Actually, you could reasonably say sin is death. Sin brought death into the world. Sin results in death. And the toll of sin in my life and yours is so much higher than we realize. The cost is so high. That is why we needed something greater than us 
to pay our sin debt. That is why 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. How then does the sinner have hope? Well, that verse obviously clued us in, but let's start with this first idea. That sin reveals my depraved state. That's the first point I want you to understand. Sin reveals depravity. And all of us have this sin problem. The passage says, and this is Apostle Paul, I want to emphasize that. This isn't just some Joe Schlum on the streets. This is Apostle Paul saying these things. For I know the good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Now, Paul is speaking of, of something of, of almost an identity crisis. At least we might call it that. And there are two major thoughts here. The first is this. Paul wants to do good, but Paul does not always do good. And of course, if this is the case for Paul, what does that say about you and me? What does that say about you? I, too, am in an identity crisis because I do not always do what I ought to do. Notice I said ought to do, not want to do. There is truth that we do not do what we want to do all the time, or what we ought to do. But we are worse off even than that. See, even our wants are not always good. Paul was speaking of how the law has enriched his understanding of morality. So because he desired to be obedient to God, then he was not doing what he wanted to do. But most of us, we live as the Bible refers to those who are guided by their bellies. The bellies are the leader, and we do not do what we want to do. But what we want to do then, we do do what we want to do, but what we want to do is terribly depraved. Paul didn't do what he wanted to do because he'd been taught by Scripture and he desired to be obedient to God. But people today are not Paul. I don't know who ever said, I don't know who would say that. I don't think anyone would. I think we all recognize this. We do not try and do good. Because we know we're not good. And that evil within us is earning for us a terrible reward. Sadly, it isn't anything good. The second major idea here that Paul brings, well, it's at the end. It's, 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 and it almost reads like something of an excuse. He says... Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin living in me that does it. And you could say, well, that sounds like an excuse. But I want to put it in a different framework. People say this, if a tree falls in the woods and no one hears it, does it make a sound? And I've heard people say, no. Now, I would argue that tree still fell. But people say no because sound is just the interpretation of vibration in the air by your eardrum. So if no one is there to hear it, perhaps there really is no sound because there's no such thing. Just as without people to consider morality, there would literally be no morals aside from beings higher than us. So let's say Paul is not making an excuse for himself. He's giving a reason for his behavior, and the reason is the same that you and I have. Sin has such a strong foothold in our lives that I could not do rightly on my own. Since I cannot do rightly, I am condemned and lost where I stand in my sinfulness. Even if I wanted to do good, wanted to, wanting and doing are, are so different, it's laughable. 
you know, I, I don't know if you guys know this. You probably do. It, in my home, I'm forgetful. If my wife's laughing, you might be able to hear. Let's say my wife had asked me to unload the dishwasher. It's easy enough, and I would normally do it, but it's also easy enough to forget. Not on purpose, mind you. But I've forgotten things like this in the past, so it happens. But if she asked me over and over again, if Sonia wanted me to empty the dishwasher and she asked me every night or every day and I never did it, if I just kept saying I forgot, even if I meant well when I said I forgot, it would be what would be best described under the best circumstances as meaningless chatter. Wanting to help is nice. But unless that bears itself out in reality, then it's worthless. What am I saying? I'm saying we cannot do good. And because we cannot do good, we cannot save ourselves. And because we cannot save ourselves, we need to stop living like we can. We need to recognize how desperate we are in the world. Listen to Paul. This is also Paul, 1 Timothy 1.15. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. So what happens to a sinner who never meets Jesus? Obviously, we can't sugarcoat this. The depraved sinner has no hope in this life apart from Jesus Christ. And what is left then is an eternity of separation from God. You know, something we've done lately uh, at home, and this might uh, make me still come across somewhat of a nerd maybe, or, or I don't know, I don't know. You can tell me what this, what this tells you about me. We've been watching I Dream of Jeannie in the house. Uh, it's nice that we can some a show we can actually watch together. Uh, something television back then barely seemed to have was, well, violence, cussing, moral themes, a lot of things actually. But uh, but it's really I think obvious that violence is is not there. I feel like today we're so inundated with violent images and gore that we hardly ever empathize with the characters in it. Not that they're real people. But I, I, you know, but I even see people at times seem excited when someone dies on screen. I mean, there's obviously some morbid fascination with it. But you know what, you, tr you try not to get callous. I try to, to think, is this, Still clear? Okay. You, you try to think, at least I've tried, because I can't help a lot of times just thinking what that person felt like. What did that do? And it makes me realize that death really is no laughing matter. Death for the Christian might be a meaningless thing. We will live again. But death for the non-Christian is anything but. It is a horrible thing. The worst thing anyone can do is die in their sins. The worst thing anyone can do is die without Jesus. Do you agree, brothers and sisters? All right, amen. I was making sure everyone can hear me still, and I was making sure you agreed, amen. And sin proves we need Jesus. My sin reveals my depravity. And my depravity, my sin, this is the second point, makes me miserable. Listen to what Paul writes. So I find this law at work in me, although I want to do good, evil is right there. And then in verse 24, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? You know what, I, I feel like people can take it for a while. We all do it for the most part. I mean, we look at people's Facebooks and, and Instagrams, and, and I guess TikTok's the thing nowadays. Uh, make myself sound hip. Um, and you know, 
people curate their lives right in front of us. And these are the best pictures they can take of themselves and the best lives they can present to the world most, most of the time. And a lot of times we do this thing where we compare our life to the best life people are showing us when, it, when all of us are really dealing with the same thing because we can fake it for a while. And I, I'm really not talking about anything simple. I'm talking about something I've seen lately. Every once in a while, and I've seen this more often, Someone literally goes onto Facebook and throws out almost this cry, this plea for attention. And I, again, I'm not talking about something simple. I'm talking about people getting online and saying things like, I don't know how I destroyed my life. And, and I even had a friend on Facebook write, I wish I was dead. Now, now normally, a lot of encouraging messages come up when people write these things. But the other day I saw this and it really struck me because I don't think I'd ever seen quite this before. I saw one like this and, and some of the plies, replies to this person were, were almost cruel uh, or downright cruel. Uh, if they were not so honest, they, at least they would be. Someone was saying how they hated their life and, and a bunch of the replies were like, get over it. <laughs> I was like, wow. And then other replies sort of clued you in. They're like, you did this to yourself. And I'm like, wow. And I was amazed, first off, that people put such things on Facebook. Maybe you guys have seen that before. But at the same time, I wasn't sure it wasn't bad advice. If what you're doing is making you miserable, you need to change something. Stop making the same mistakes over and over. But isn't that what Paul's saying? He's making the same mistakes, or we're making the same mistakes over and over. That's so hard to just stop it. I mean, not making the same mistakes over and over. Proverbs 26, 11, very famous Proverbs says, it, as a dog returns to his vomit, so fools repeat their folly. Because I think most of us have realized our lives are oftentimes full of mistakes. And we begin to think that we're mistakes. Now before we get any further, let me say you're not. Christ Jesus didn't, God didn't say oops when he made any of us. Christ Jesus has a real plan for all of our lives. You're not a mistake. You're not a mistake. I want you to get this. You're not a mistake. Hang with me for a little bit. Well, you can fake it for a time. And eventually your sins will find you. And what does sin bring you? What does sin breed in your life? It breeds misery before it breeds death. And we fall into these cycles of misery. We think misery is normal. We have a whole bunch of people in our country living in sin. And it's straining their minds and its conscience and it's hurting them. But they've gotten so numb to the pain, they don't know anything better or greater or grander or more. I think that, brothers and sisters, that's why we present the world Jesus Christ, because people need something to compare the muck and the mire they're living into. All people are living the same. If you never see something greater than the way you're living, why would you ever change anything? Maybe some people are saying, I'm not faking it. It might just mean you're way worse. Maybe you're living it up. Let me tell you something. You can only play around for so long. And if you manage to live in blissful ignorance through your whole life, you will pay dearly in the afterlife. You can't live that way. Only Jesus gives real fulfillment. My sin reveals my depravity. My depravity makes me miserable. But wait, brothers and sisters, my misery can lead me to hope. Here's a fun theological, philosophical question, I guess. Philosophical question. What's the point of pain? Does pain have a point? What would, why would God make us so that we could be miserable? Perhaps there's a good reason God gave us pain. Now, I'm not saying anyone wants pain, but the point of pain is so you don't have pain. 
And I'm not having cyclical reasoning here. I, you'll see what I mean. If you didn't have pain receptors, if you didn't feel pain, you wouldn't know when you were hurt. If you didn't know when you were hurt, you would keep getting hurt. If you kept getting hurt, you'd eventually get too hurt. And if you got too hurt, you'll die. But if you can feel the pain and stop yourself, you might just live. Pain is necessary in a broken and fallen world. And again, no one wants pain. But that's why we have pain. Because if the world is broken, situations will come about that will teach us fundamental truths and we can learn from them, learn to avoid the pain, or we can do as the dog does. But hopefully we learn you cannot stick your hand in the fire and not get burned. I think of this line in our passage. I think of this line a lot, actually. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body that's subject to death? Paul is saying, who will save me? Who can save me? And I hear this. I hear this. Please help me. There are times we don't know what to do. And there are times we're on a last leg or we're hanging on by our last thread or we're about to go over the deep end or we're up the river without a paddle or any number of different ways we say this. If we don't get some help, we don't know what we'll do. And that's exactly the idea Paul is making. You cannot do it on your own. You can solve some things maybe with ingenuity. You can fix some things with grace and charm. You can wrestle some things down with the might of your arms and your legs, but there are elements that are out of your control if you need saving. And you yourself are the problem. How then can you save yourself? You can't. But the pain of sin points us to the hope of Christ Jesus. O wretched man that I am, who can save me from this sin, from this death? Jesus can. Thanks be to God. This is verse 25. Who delivers me through Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, I mean this as literally as I can. Actually, let me let me tell you something, because people, I've been hearing this all the time, people use the word literally all the time to mean figuratively. It drives me nuts. They say, I literally could not speak. I was literally on my last leg. The fish was literally this big. The biggest fish I'd ever seen. People use literally all the time to mean anything but literally. It's weird. But when I say I'm not being figurative, I am being literal. I want you to understand, I am being absolutely, completely straightforward and as literal as I can be. You cannot do it on your own. Only Jesus saves us from sin. And that sin is ingrained in our very being. Our souls are tainted. We are totally doomed without Christ. The Bible says that we are dead in our sins and our trespasses. But with Christ, we have all the hope, in not just the world, but in all of eternity. In Christ, we're set free. Listen to the beginning of, of chapter 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. There might be sin in us. And you know, most of us are willing to admit it. You know, there are times you like sin. If you didn't like it, you probably wouldn't do it. But you do do it. Sin, like Satan, presents itself as an angel of light. You have flesh and flesh desires fleshly things. But let me give you this warning. You may want to sin, but you won't want what it does to you. You won't like where it takes you, and you can't pay what it costs you. And most of us have grown numb 
to the sin around us. We no longer feel the pains that were meant to warn us to turn around. Remember when you were younger and you watched your words around adults? Maybe some of us did that, maybe others didn't, I don't know. I mean, you knew the words you weren't supposed to say. But you also knew if you said them, you would get your mouth washed out with soap. They would ever have their mouth washed out with soap? No one here? Oh, we have a, we have a few. That stuff tastes terrible. How can something that tastes so bad clean? But boy, have times changed. We hardly lose a step anymore with the cussing, the fighting, the politicking, the dishonesty, the unfaithfulness, the vileness, the anger, the malice, the untrustworthy things that live in us. Sin is so prevalent we hardly notice it. We become numb to the warning signs. And if you don't see the warning, what do you think happens? It's like there's flashing lights, sirens, but we're blind to them. You know, addiction does that. Actually, addiction does something worse still. It's one of the most amazing things about addiction, and I don't mean that in a good way. They say that people don't think it will happen to them. Maybe at first. Maybe there's a little bit of truth to that. But I don't believe that. They say that, but they knew. They were facing for it. They were looking. They saw all the signs around them. How could anyone think it would not happen to them when it happens to all of us? When it happens to all of us. Addiction doesn't make you think you're invincible. It makes you so weak that you cannot avoid the trap you're walking toward. You begin to think you cannot fix it. You begin to think you're too far gone. And now the only semblance of joy in your life is that addiction. And it slowly, slowly strangles the life out of you. Addiction doesn't give you anything. It takes all the other things away. Slowly but surely takes your family away, it takes your friendships away, and it takes your life away. And we're all addicts. We're addicted to sinfulness. Apart from Christ, we're utterly hopeless. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? That's why I love Romans 8. See, it's the good news. So much good news. Here's verses um, 3 and 4. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. If you're listening right now, and you're not a believer, would you admit you have sinned in your life? If you have sinned in your life, hopefully you'd admit you're a sinner. I don't say that to condemn you, because I, I was as sinful as anybody. I think most of us here would admit we had sin in our lives. But I want to tell you this. You don't have to be that way. You don't have to live that way. It doesn't have to be this way. I'm not saying that Christians don't sin, but Christ has freed us from the condemnation and ultimately the most dire consequence of sin. He wanted to save you, was willing to save us, and through the cross can save anyone who would believe. That is why Christ paid the penalty for sin. Why? Because God loves you. He has seen what sin has done and will do in your life, and he wanted to save you from it. And today is the day to choose. Choose to put your faith in Jesus. You might be listening today. And I know we've all been there. When we feel down and out, we feel lost. You know, you can be honest with yourself. No one's, no one's looking. You're in your own house probably listening. Some of you are in your car. 
I can see you, but I can't see you that well. But you know what? We, we feel it. We feel the sting of sin. We know what it's cost. I'll tell you what. There is a God out there who would give anything for you. And not only would he, he did. He sent his son Jesus who died for your sin. As the word says, he who knew no sin became sin for you so that you could have the righteousness of God. So that you could be free from this depravity. So you could be free from the stain of sin that so prevails everything that we can hardly see our way out of it. But even though we couldn't see our way out of it, it doesn't mean God couldn't see the way through for us. And he did for you. If you're watching and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, today is the perfect day to turn from anything in you, turn from those things that, that the Bible refers to as wicked ways, repent from the sin in your life, turn to Jesus Christ, put your faith and your trust in him, and the Bible tells us God does not reject you, God accepts you. Through the sacrifice of Jesus, when he looks at you, he will not see you in your sin. He will see his son, Jesus Christ, and the righteousness of Christ if you put your faith and trust truly in him and believe with your heart. God will help you. But you must put your faith and trust in him. And if you don't take Jesus, there is no other way. See, we might be, some people say utterly depraved. We might be pretty sinful. But that doesn't mean God wouldn't make the way for us. God has made a way, and that way is Jesus. And if you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, today is the day to believe. I'm going to pray for I'm going to pray for you and I'm going to pray for us here in this morning. I'm going to give you a chance to pray. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I'm going to pray. It's not some special hidden, special magic words. It's whether you mean it in your heart. You just go to God, you ask Him to forgive you of your sins, you tell Him you accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You make Him Lord and Savior of your life and see what He's going to do. And then I want you to call a brother and sister in Jesus Christ, someone you know, someone you trust, call them, call me, and tell them what you've done. And they're going to smile, they're going to hug you if they can, except there's coronavirus, so it might be an air hug. But they're going to rejoice with you. If you've never accepted Jesus and you'd like to do that right now, you can pray with me. Say, Dear God, I'm sorry for the sins in my life but I now know you'll forgive me. I accept your son Jesus. I accept his sacrifice on the cross. I accept your free gift of salvation. And I thank you, God, that you will save me through your son Jesus. Please save me today. Make me a child of the King. I accept that gift. And I thank you. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. If you prayed that and you meant that for the first time, I want you to contact a brother and sister in Christ Jesus and let them know. If you're here today and, and you're, you're still with me, I know we've all been there. I don't know what you're dealing with today. I know there are many times we will, as Christians, fall flat in our faces again. We'll stand back up, we'll fall down. You know what the beautiful thing about being a Christian is Jesus never abandons us. God never forsakes us. He never leaves us. He's always there to pick us back up when we mess up. He's always there to put us right back on the path that he started us on. Because the Lord will bring us to his holy completion. He will bring us there. I want to pray for you guys. I want to pray for us. If you just join me in a word of prayer, I'm going to pray for you. 
Dear Lord, my God, I thank you for bringing us together today. I thank you, Lord, for the truth that you have set us free, that you free us, that you love us, and that, God, we are ultimately something entirely new in you. Lord, I pray that you would help us to live in that newness. God, to be wise to the ways of scheming in the world, innocent as doves toward those in the world and cunning as serpents in the world, but near to you, our God. Bless us, Lord, as we depart from this place. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do. It's in your holy and precious name I pray. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for joining me online. Hope that's been a blessing. Has anyone been blessed today? Amen. The people still with me? No one fell asleep. I didn't see a single soul. But uh, Frank down there, he's got good tent, so I couldn't tell anyway. But the rest, <laughs> I'm just kidding, Frank. <laughs> it's been such a blessing having you with me today. Starting next week, we're going to get an opportunity to get back in church. We're still going to have the Facebook services. But I'm just so honored that you guys would come and hang out with me Sunday morning. And uh, I'll be praying for you this week. God bless you. Thank you. I'll see you soon. Did you hear me? Oh, sure, sure. Jane helped me last week. I wasn't going to bother anybody, but uh, it was nice. You know what? Just a, a minute or two of that. Well, that finishes. I just put a little music on. Oh, cool. Yeah, I just bring the card out and I'm moving on. That would be great to have some help. Thanks. Did you like the sermon? Yeah, so I, I, I thought of you when I was preaching that because it made me think of the old sermon you always talked about. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, whenever, you know, that was in particular, uh, you know, he was talking about, you know, you know, he wants to do, he can't do. You know, and Jim Miller talks about that. You know what, brother? Let me tell you, you can probably hear him. Ha, ha, ha.